So, uh, after last night's game, I'm just emotionally unstable. So there's there's no telling what's gonna what's gonna happen today. Um, it is it's my pleasure and delight, truly honor uh, to 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 be here uh, with you guys this morning. Uh, what a great rendition of Reckless Love we just we just listened to and. Uh, I hope you you believe those those words to be true, right? There's literally no mountain God wouldn't climb up to get after us. So he literally climbed a mountain, right? Golgotha, the place of the skull, got up on a mountain and died so that you and I might live, and that's what we celebrate here today. Uh, we're continuing on in our our series of Kingdom according to Genesis, and and just to reiterate that that title comes from this idea of Jesus Christ having proclaimed the kingdom in his arrival in, uh, in, in Bethlehem and then in Nazareth as he taught his disciples that the kingdom was here. We want to emphasize that that kingdom is always present ever throughout the Bible, that it's not something that begins in the New Testament, but rather God's unfolding plan of love and redemption begins even in the pages of Genesis. And so we find ourselves in Genesis 32 this morning and uh, if you liken it to like a good streaming Netflix show, we're about season three now of this Abraham family drama. Uh, in season one, we got Abraham called out by God and he follows and he's kind of in and out of the land of Canaan, sometimes displaying great faith in God and being exemplary, right? But many times showing how deeply flawed he is, but God gives him grace anyway. That's the deep lesson that we learned from Abraham. He blessed him with his own son, Isaac. He even gave Abraham the opportunity to see Isaac become a man, find a wife for himself, Rebecca, before Abraham passed away. Season two, Isaac's a dad now, right? And we see him re repeating a lot of Abraham's mistakes. And he has these two sons, Jacob and Esau, who are just trouble, right? Jacob's this shady little thief. Esau's kind of dumb, right? He just gets taken and taken and taken and gets irritated about it. Really, he should have just been smarter. And, and now we're re-entering the story here in, Gen in Genesis 32 with Jacob himself at a major crossroads. And, and what we're, what we're going to be looking at this morning, we've, we've kind of spent a lot of time looking at this grand picture of all that God's doing in this family. But today we're going to get really personal just with Jacob and his heart and his struggles and how that relates to us on a personal level. See, Jacob has to come to terms with his misplaced independence and self-sufficiency. I think that's common for all of us, believing ourselves to be sufficient in and of ourselves to accomplish the task before us and doing so in an independent way. I've got all the best ideas because I know me best. And now Jacob is at the end of himself. Nothing's working. And God meets him in this space. And so he arrives at a spot that I think we all need to understand. You can't fully experience the blessings of God while living your life independent from him. You can't fully experience the blessings of God while living your life independent from him. That's what this text is about. Let's read it together. We'll pick it up in Genesis 32. I'm going to read 22 to 32, and then we'll expound it. The same night he arose and took his two wives, his two female servants, his 11 children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else he had. And Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket. and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go for the rest for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. And Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. 
Therefore, to this day, the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, thank you again uh, just for your presence, your kindness, your goodness. Thank you for this word and this scripture. We ask that you would uh, open up hearts and minds that we might hear you clearly, that you would speak through me correctly and truthfully so that you might be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, I have to just admit on the surface, so throughout the week, it's a, it's a process of writing the sermon, right? And writing a sermon is, is tantamount to writing a research paper often, so it's a weekly, a weekly project. And uh, I had written down my introduction a few days ago, and it starts with the line, welcome to the year of heat culture. I don't want to say that right now. <laughs> I, just don't, I just don't feel like uttering those words right now. <laughs> and the idea is that if you hadn't, whether you're watching the NBA or not, the Miami Heat are known for having uh, this culture, and it's been a little bit of a caricature, but whether you watch, again, whether you watch basketball or not, the idea is this. The Miami Heat are a basketball team that are known for how they develop their players, right? And so it's infamous that there's these fitness tests that players have to pass that aren't typical for million dollar, multi-million dollar NBA players to have to do. We get, we get the picture of the high school coach, right? Samuel L. Jackson, Coach Carter, locking the gym doors, and you got to run sprints until, until he's pleased with it. Now imagine, you know, a 30-year-old man who's got millions listening to a coach like that. They probably just get him fired. But for some reason, the Miami Heat have been successful in developing players through a system like that. And the idea is this that joining the Miami Heat, you've got to relinquish independence. The way you did things, the way you went about your training regiment and schedule, you've got to put that aside and become a part of something larger, buying into it. You've got to be humble enough to put independence to the side, buy into a larger vision. I think we all exist in a broader culture that actually emphasizes the opposite. Uh, our broader culture would tell you that your independence is what matters the most, that, that giving those things up is precisely what's wrong with the church, right? It's an institution where you have to give up so much of yourself to become this caricature, but rather we are uh, meant to be independent. However, the same culture that promotes this idea of independence has no resources to help us when that approach doesn't work. So as I go through life trying to decide things on my own, throwing out anything that doesn't, that doesn't already serve my current vision with what my life should be, what happens when that doesn't work? And Jacob here is faced with that dilemma. He's trying to be independent, trying to do things on his own, wrestling with Pat Riley, if you will. That's a bad example, right? Because he's, he's wrestling with God here. Throw that out. Strike that from the record. Jacob here is faced with the reality that his attempts at blessing himself, all of those have failed. And they may have even made his life worse. And so I want us to look at three things that, that, are, that are true for, for Jacob's experience that also need to be true of each of your experiences individually. One, a personal encounter. Jacob has a personal encounter with God, and you need a personal encounter with God. Secondly, Jacob experiences a divine blessing as opposed to blessing himself and searching for his own blessing. And then lastly, we see that Jacob's encounter with God receiving this blessing came at a high cost, and yours will as well. Let's begin with a personal encounter. Just before our passage, Jacob becomes aware that Esau is trying to kill him. So the background of the story, again, is, is Jacob deceives Esau, uh, Esau, uh, of taking his birthright. Uh, he deceives uh, his father Isaac again, stealing the blessing. It's just Jacob's lying and tricking and deceiving all the while. Now, what's also true that we, we haven't probably haven't processed is Jacob and Esau haven't seen each other in years. If you remember, Jacob goes to Laban to try and marry Rachel, and Jacob kind of meets a guy who's just like him. He's deceptive and untruthful. And so Laban tricks Jacob into working for him for 14 years. That's how long it's been since Jacob and Esau have seen each other. 
And so Jacob sends messengers with gifts for Esau, hoping to turn away his anger. He's, he's come to the realization that Esau, Esau is trying to find him and he wants to kill him. It's been 14 years since they've seen each other. There's no relational equity at this point to bind them together. This is just a guy who's been mad at me for a long time. He's got an army. He's hunting for me. Let me send gifts ahead to see if I can hold him back. Jacob is in real internal turmoil at this point. He has marital problems. Remember, he's got two wives. They're sisters, and he only loves one of them. And he's only supposed to be married to one of them, according to to God's law. He has beef with Esau that he caused by robbing him. Here Jacob is at the end of himself. And so what breaks out is a personal encounter with God. If you look with me at verse 24, Jacob is heading back to Canaan. He sends his family ahead across the river on this journey. And then we're told, I believe there's no no word wasted in scripture. We're told in verse 24, Jacob was left alone. There's nobody around, no distractions, no kids to keep from, you know, maybe Joe, I don't know how old Joseph is at this time. Maybe Joseph is one of those babies that likes to just put stuff in his mouth and, you know, it's a choking hazard. None of that distraction is around Jacob. He's, the, the whole family is across the river, all of his 11 kids, both of his wives, his female servants, and he is by himself, just him and God. In order for real change and blessing to happen, you need to be alone with Jesus. It just needs to happen. It really needs to be a regular rhythm. You need a personal encounter with God. And so what's true for Jacob is also true for you. Number one, familial proximity is not enough. Just having a family and the people around you being close to God is not enough to get you personally, individually close to God. Think about it. Jacob comes from a family that's surrounded by God's blessing. That's who they are. He's, he's Abraham's grandson. That's, that's as much notoriety as you can possibly get. God's covenant promises to Abraham and Isaac. He, he called Abraham out of the land of Ur and sends him to Canaan and repeats these blessings to Isaac. And you're going to have uh, descendants like the stars in the sky. Like they're, they're surrounded by the covenantal blessings. Jacob, Jacob bears the sign of the covenant. He's a circumcised man. And so Jacob, as a recipient of these exact same promises, has yet to experience a personal relationship with God. He's just kind of in the family. Covenantal promises are there. Abraham telling stories. Isaac telling stories. Rebecca telling stories. But the problem is you can't know Jesus through other people. You can be introduced to him by other people, but you got to get to know him yourself. See, it's like when you, when you meet someone for the first time, I can, I can introduce you to my family, right? I can introduce you to my wife. Hi, her name is Bridget. Here's, here's my kids. It's Braxton. That's Giselle. It's Miles. But if you want to have a relationship with them, that you, you've got to have a personal encounter with them. You've got to speak to them. I can't do that for you. It's the same thing. With God. Secondly, cultural proximity is not enough either. I think there's a real Christian subculture that exists, right? It's identified by various things. For kids, sometimes it's just hanging out at youth group, right? A regular, a regular rhythm, or coming on Sundays and going in the kids' room, or churches that have Wednesday night services for kids. There's young adult groups like that. I remember going to one early on in my Christian faith. It'd just be a lot of people locally that would go to these young adult services get together for uh for for sporting activities volleyball to get game nights right hanging out or for families there's kind of this christian subculture of the suburban life like if i uh if i live okay and in, in my own home with with a front yard and a backyard and uh, we do family like things and hang out with other like-minded christian families you just kind of get immersed in this christian subculture It's as if liking things that other Christians generally like is good enough to make you a Christian. Again, it's important that you understand you need a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. The culture can't save you. I talk a lot about the joys of teaching ministry at a Christian school, right? I love it. It's an opportunity to be able to connect with kids on a a deeper level, to, to field questions that 
you know, I don't get a lot. Kids are very in, in, inquisitive and, and, and honest, right? And so you get to dive deep into things that, uh, that Jesus has for us. And it's incredible to see what God does over a long period of time, just watching lives play out and, and families form and kids get married. But I see hard realities too, right? It's not all roses. It's not every kid that I teach grows up and loves Jesus and their lives are transformed into something beautiful. It's also hard to watch kids make really poor choices. I've seen many excel in high school. When I say excel, they're answering questions and they're interested in the Bible. They go off to college and lose their faith. I see it a lot. So what happens then? How does someone go from being immersed in this Christian culture, just being around Christianity and even participating in it at some level and then going off to college and forsaking that? Here's my, my theory. In a lot of cases, Jesus never got beyond the cultural and familial for that individual person. It was a cultural thing. It was a family thing. My parents brought me to church, and I was, I was in youth group, and I was around other Christians. And so there's Bible class, there's chapel, there's youth group. But if there's never alone time with God, then your culture and environment can change, right? So, so growing up, maybe you've got this family and this culture that's around you, and, the, and it's significant to you. But as you go off to college, and, and those of you that have been already, you understand there becomes kind of a functional family environment there as well. Your new friends kind of become your family. Your favorite professors become your family. Your, your sweet mates, the, the people on the, in, in the dorm hall with you, they become your functional family. And if their values are not Christian values, and you just buy into whatever is cultural, it's not long before those Christian values depart as well. You see kids embrace a new family, be immersed in a new culture, one that doesn't include Jesus Christ, and now all of a sudden faith is gone. When faith doesn't become personal, then whatever little bit was there will fade away. Every follower of Jesus Christ must have a personal encounter with God. Doesn't have to be dramatic, right? We're not talking about the the wild conversions. And if you had one, that's amazing. And proclaim that and, and be proud of that. But sometimes we hold that up, these wild conversions. Of, you know, I was in a gutter, literally a gutter, and Jesus came and picked me up. You don't have to be in a gutter, right? You can be at home too. He can find you there. But you do need to have a personal encounter with God. Finally, I think it's worth stating that pragmatic reasons won't save you either. As much as society hates on the church, I think there's still an understanding, especially here in South Florida, that the church is a place of healing. People know that if I want to I wanna feel better, I want to meet people with a positive outlook on life, I can, I can go to church, right? People still you know, slap the Jesus fish on their business because they know it makes them look more uh, like, like they have more integrity. People will show up at church and network. The music we sing, the prayers we pray, they have a way of, of, of bringing you into a positive state of mind. But if you're just joining the church to improve your life, let me state this clearly. That is a noble reason to start coming to church. I want my life to be better, and so I'm here, and I want to find Jesus in it. But if you never find Jesus in it, it's just these ancillary parts of the church that, that make you feel better about yourself and, and networking and friendships. That will fade away. It's self-sufficient independence that will eventually fail you. See, what all of us need is for God to sift our hearts himself. We need God to, to make us uncomfortable, to reveal the parts that we, that we hide. Even when we, even when we do the humble thing, you know what I'm talking about. You get in a group of other Christians and you start to admit your faults. You're not admitting your faults, right? You were selective about the ones that you feel like are acceptable to say out loud and still keeping the real ones that you're ashamed of dark and hidden within your heart. You need God to deal with those ones. You need God himself to get in there and do some difficult work in order for you to really have a relationship with him. That can only happen if you personally encounter Jesus Christ. And so this is what happens with Jacob. He has this personal encounter with God. And as it starts to get uncomfortable, God literally wrestling with him. Title of this sermon is WrestleMania because I'm corny. God's literally wrestling with Jacob to reveal these, these uncomfortable parts of Jacob's soul. And what he starts to reveal 
and understand is that he needs a divine blessing. He's been looking to bless himself in the wrong way. See, Jacob, this is our second point, a divine blessing. Jacob wrestles with God until God blesses him. Look with me again, beginning at verse, uh, verse 25. When the man saw he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket. Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. And then he said, let me go for the day is broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. And God does bless him. Changes his name to Israel, right? The promise of this, this nation where God's people would come from. Jacob had already tried two pretty misplaced ways to bless himself. And when I say bless himself, I'm, I'm talking about he's looking for satisfaction. He's looking for purpose. He's looking for joy. And the way he's trying to find that is the wrong way. The first way that he does it is he tries money, right? I'm going to rob my brother. And if I get his birthright and blessings, I'm going to be good. I'll have wealth and I'll have possessions and my life will be just fine. He tries love, right? Works all those years to marry Rachel. It sounds romantic. Man, he really loves her. He's going to work seven years to, to, to be married to Rachel. Really, what's happening there, it's idolatry. He believes that this beautiful woman is going to satisfy his soul, and that's not what happens. So you have to wonder, what first would drive Jacob to want to steal his brother's birthright and blessing? It's a pretty wicked thing. Of course, I think the answer is it's materialism. Jacob thought that having more stuff would give him a good life. And that's not what happens at all. See, his plan works, right? He's, he's able to successfully, he's got the bowl of stew, and he says, hey, Esau, you look kind of hungry. How about I give you this bowl of stew and you give me your birthright? Or the plan later on to get the blessing where he puts the, the goat's hair on his arms and his hands and, and causes his father Isaac to bless the wrong kid. He gained money. But what did it cost him? It cost him a relationship with his brother. And we can see that in this moment, alone with God, family on the other side of the river, those possessions and things aren't comforting him at all. He misses his brother, and he wants to be right with him. Jacob thought then that what he needed was a beautiful woman to call his wife. And we all know how that turned out. One thing leads to another. Now he's got two wives, sisters, one of whom he doesn't love at all. And now his pursuit of relationship for fulfillment has created big problems for him. Studies show that the world has higher rates of depression than it ever has in the history of the world. Now, I think two things are true. Of course, there's improvement in medical testing. So we're, able to, we're just able to diagnose rates of depression better than we ever had before. So I'm sure there were high rates before. We just didn't know what it was, but I think it's also true that the world has more stuff in general. And the more stuff the world has, we are more able to see it through social media and the internet. Technology has made us so connected, and one of the downsides of the connectedness of technology is I'm able to covet more. Things that I didn't even know existed. I want that. I gotta have that. My life won't have meaning unless I get that. We're back in the day, right? You're doing that AOL dial-up, right? Takes too long to cover it. I got, I got to go do something else, right? I can't wait for this thing to connect to the internet. Now it's just in my pocket, right? It's the presentation of the perfect family. So you want that, right? You see the, the social media influencers and you see, uh, you, you see how, how great they look. Well, really, it's, it's lighting and camera work, guys. They fight as well. They might have fought to take that picture, right? We all know that story. It's the perfect workout plan, right? So you want that. Forgetting Photoshop's a real thing. People use that edit tool a lot, sliding that bar from, from, from right to left till it looks just right. Post. And then we're like, man, I wish I could look like that. Just, just slide it a little bit more to the left. You'll look just like that. It's the appearance of carefree joy, and we want that as well. There's a recent article from January from the Harvard Business Review. Let me not sound like I'm like posing. I don't read the Harvard Business Review. This is just an article I noticed that looks interesting. It's called Why Success Doesn't Lead to Satisfaction. It's a lengthy quote, but I want to read it because I think it's good. The author says this, The insatiable goals to acquire more succeed conspicuously be as attractive as possible, 
They lead us to objectify one another and even ourselves. When people see themselves as little more than their attractive bodies, jobs, or bank accounts, it brings great suffering. Sounds like Christian preaching. You become a heartless taskmaster to yourself. Love and fun are sacrificed for another day of work. And in search of a positive internal answer to the question, am I successful yet? We become cardboard cutouts of real people. Now, how true is that? Here's the game that we play. We see other people live in despair like that. We all know the stories, right? I could have inserted into my notes this morning, celebrity example who has lots of money and is depressed. You've heard that story before. Here's how we interpret all of that. Well, if I had that money and I had those resources, I would just do it differently. I wouldn't be depressed. Yes, you would. You'll convince yourself that getting these things you want would make you happy. Other people are just doing it wrong. You've got better intellect and processes, and you will do so much better. Here's what Dr. Tim Keller says, the gift that keeps on giving. We are unhappy even in success because we seek happiness from success. Believing that if I have more, even, if, even in believing that if I did it differently than the celebrities who quote unquote did it wrong, if I'm looking for those things, the material blessings like Jacob did to bring me happiness, I'm going to fall into the same pit. It's going to be the same trap, same outcome. The first commandment is really clear. Have no other gods before God. It's not some unwarranted jealousy. It's wisdom from God that if I don't love him first and beyond all other things, my life's going to be out of place, out of order, and destructive. This is God showing you the proper way to order your affection. I got one more quote. Can I give you one more quote? Whitney Houston. Think about it. There must be a higher love down in the heart or hidden in the stars above. Without it, life is wasted time. Bring me a higher love. Oh. I don't think she knew what she was talking about, clearly. However, the concept is there. The love that we search for in this world, from other people, in fleeting relationships, it's not enough to cure what's deep within. We need a higher love, the love of God. See, what we, all, what we would all agree is it's good to love your job, for example. You were taught in school and taught by your parents correctly that if you love what you do, you won't work a day in your life. Not really, but... You'll, you'll just like it more than if you didn't like your job, right? And so it's good to love your job. It's good to have hobbies that you enjoy. When you're not working, find things to do with your time that, that bring you joy and bring you life. I think we would all agree, however, that loving my job and loving my hobbies more than I love my children is out of order, right? It's good to love your job. It's good to love your hobbies. You should probably love your kids more than you love those things. I think we could also argue that getting that order wrong is not just a, a slight misstep, but it's the difference between joy and misery. If I love my job more than I love my kids, I'm going to have a miserable life. Not going to be home enough, not going to spend time with them. They start to foster problems and resentment toward me, and now my life is chaos. Or if I just spent a little bit more time with them than I spend with my job, that problem is solved. This is even more true with God. If I put anything above my love and affection for God, I'm going to experience chaos. My job, even my kids, if I love my kids more than I love Jesus Christ, I'm going to bring harm on my kids. My expectations will be unattainable. My approach to them will be absolutely crushing as they try to live up to the weight of being my God, which they were never created to be. If I have God first, then I can approach my desire for wealth with the proper perspective. Resources that are properly understood as tools for the advancement of God's kingdom, not my personal kingdom, which will die and be non-existent anyway. If I have God first, then I can approach my relationships with the proper perspective. Instead of seeing my wife and kids as the source of my happiness, see them as blessings from God who is my happiness. See them as an opportunity to display the love that God has given me 
so that they might give that love to others. Not destroying them under the weight of having to be my happiness. This is probably how Rachel felt in relation to Jacob. I worked seven years for you, babe. I love you so much. She's probably like, chill, I just need, I need some space, Jacob. Not dismissing them as useless for my happiness. That's probably how Leah felt. You don't serve my personal happiness, therefore you don't matter at all. That's how Jacob treated her. See, loving Jesus more than anything else is the real key to happiness, and this is what Jacob had to learn. His blessing had to come from God, not himself. It wasn't working. God's kingdom is not for the self-sufficient who try to find blessing in things other than God. Well, let me, let me close with this. This comes at a high cost. This isn't just a, a conversation that, that Jacob has with God and then something clicks. Oh, I get it now. I'm pursuing the wrong things. God had to, had to actually break something in Jacob in order for him to get that. In the wrestling match, you see there, God dislocates Jacob's hip. And we're not just talking about just a, a quick move that disabled him for a second so he can get the tap out and then, and then move on, but it says now Jacob walks with a limp. He bears the mark of this encounter with God everywhere he goes and everybody can see it. His personal encounter with God was costly. Jesus says this famously in Luke chapter 14, if anyone comes to me, does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. It's a pretty jarring statement. What does this talk about hating your family? Are we supposed to love our family? Why would Jesus say something like that? Because what Jesus is getting at is putting my family above him is like hating them anyway. If I love my family, if I love my kids, if I love my possessions, if I love my job, I love my hobbies, I love my house more than I love Jesus Christ, it's tantamount to hatred of them because of the experience of them trying to be my God. That kind of weight will destroy all the things that you love. This means that you've got to make some hard decisions. You have a personal encounter with God. You realize that blessings can only come from him. That means you might have to sever some relationships with things that you're trying to get blessings from. That's not easy. Jacob couldn't continue to try and find blessing on his own. It was killing him, and that re realization is never easy. What are you holding on to that you need to let go of? Is it an idea? Is it a person? Is it a possession? Is it a location? Is it a career? Is it a specific job? Anything that you're holding on to, it says this, is, this has to be part of the equation in order for me to be happy and fulfilled, you're probably holding on to that too tightly. Letting it go isn't easy. I'm not up here trying to tell you this is something that's, that's simple to do and just go and do it tomorrow. You've got to do some real business with God. You've got to wrestle with him as Jacob did. But once God puts his finger on that part of your life, it says, that's got to go in order for you to serve me. You've got to make that decision. Let go of it. Get rid of it. Sever ties with it. Because the blessing you experience from God is far greater. Second question I'll ask is, how are you trying to bless yourself apart from Jesus? How are you looking at Jesus as, as one option amongst many, but I've got these better options here and I'm going to keep going in this direction and kind of tack Jesus on at, at, at the end and hope that he improves what I'm already trying to do. Jesus isn't here to sprinkle fairy dust on your idolatry. Jesus is here to break your idols and cause you to follow him and him alone. And so my prayer for each and every single one of us is that Christianity would not be something that's just familial for you. I've gone to church my whole life, right? Started off at the Episcopal Church on Riverside, went to, went to Coral Baptist on University in Riverside, and then it became Church by the Glades. I've gone to church my entire life, but it wasn't until after high school that there was a personal encounter. I said, I've got to follow Jesus. This is, this is between me and him, not just what me and my family have done our entire lives. That decision needs to be personal for you as well. And so my prayer today is that you would make that decision to follow Jesus Christ, 
that if you're already following Jesus Christ and you've got that that mission drift that tends to happen, you're being confused and tempted by the world and all of its distractions, that today on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit would do what he's promised to do and bring about the conviction that you need to follow him and follow him alone. Let's pray together. Holy Spirit, we pray to you as God to do what you've promised to do, to glorify Jesus Christ in our hearts that we might see him clearly. And if we see him clearly, we will see him in all of his beauty and glory. A light that breaks through the shadows shows itself to us as being the light that we need to be drawn to. God, I ask that you would do that in our hearts this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.